Well, I'm sure I was sent to this planet as an artist, I'm convinced. Mm -hmm. Got off to a very slow start. I got off to no start, really, because I grew up on a farm in a large family. There was no art in our schools, not a trace of any art being taught in our schools. So, um, occasionally I heard the names of some old masters like Michelangelo and Rembrandt, and I, I thought, artist, artist, and sort of, you know, the idea kind of stuck in my head, but there, it was a whole big mystery. So, um, also, there was no money for me to go to art school. So, um, I did go on graduating from high school. I went to Auburn University, but not to study art, to study business, sort of, to support myself. Um, that was, you know, still, still not thinking, of my, not imaging myself as an artist yet at all. I was there a very short time, and then I came back. I came back to where my parents lived in Alabama. This was the farm was in Alabama, and um, and so then I found my way to Atlanta. This the artist in me was beginning to stir a little by now, so I went to Atlanta College of Art, but not to get a full degree. I just went to sort of study what I needed to learn. At, and um, I noticed that, and, and at the same time I was starting to w just draw or do whatever I could on my own. And um, so I noticed that um, I never used what I learned, what I learned in uh, going to classes at Atlanta College of Art. I never used that in my work when I would work on my own, except for printmaking. That, that really drew me, and so I just think there was a natural printmaker sensibility there that I needed to um, pursue. And that was when ACA was down in that old warehouse down on uh, Pine, near Pine Street, and Norman Wagner had just come to ACA, and um, so he gave me, so I learned from him the base of basics of uh, etching, which was mm -hmm. the medium that I really the printmaking medium that I really was drawn to. That would be about mid-60s, I don't know what year. Mm -hmm. The printmaking instinct was really sort of beginning to take me over, and I did large color woodcuts that were the, was the first work that got any notice um, any by um, you know galleries or anybody, collectors mm -hmm. or anybody. Yeah, it was late 70s that I got interested in handmade paper. It was very satisfying at first to, to think, oh wow, hey, I made a piece of paper myself with sl from sloshy pulp. And I actually went to uh, the Twin Rocker paper mill in Indiana mm -hmm. two times. Mm -hmm to work with them to try to create some pieces that were worthy of exhibiting. The thing that did it did do, that experience did for me, was put me in touch of the, with the network for artist books. The first one was just a simple little um, black and white book titled um, Power Poem about power in our lives. And it, um, and uh, the second one was a huge, giant step because I used uh, etchings and um, print letterpress, and uh, that was, and the letterpress was done at, at Atlanta College of Art because it was before I got my my own letterpress, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. proof press they're called, um, and um, it was a small edition of twelve, and it was it got. Um, into the New York Public Library, into MoMA, into MoMA, it got into good collections right away, and I thought, well, Ruth, you know, maybe you're on a good track, so. The, the body of work that I think was, that I felt best about and was probably the most successful were those parcel paintings, remember those? Mm -hmm. they, were, they were, they looked like, um, 
ob, um, packages or parcels. Mm -hmm. You even uh, had string they were tied, a string, uh -huh. and they had right. a label like image on there and words. And so, because I was thinking about when you receive something in the mail, about a package or a letter, or anything, it's a page of information. It's like handle mm -hmm. carefully, you know, and various um, mm -hmm. instructions on there. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea behind that, those paintings. Mm -hmm. But that again, I stopped midstream because I think I, I felt almost like. I had exhausted that idea, mm -hmm. and plus the books were nagging at me. <laughs> Mail art is important to me because it's an impulsive thing. It's not going, mm -hmm. it's not work to be, to go in a show. It's, mm -hmm. it's something you send out in the world. Just when you don't know always whether it'll arrive, you just, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's like a little gift, and but you don't, and you don't always expect a reply, but you usually do get one, and so you develop a few little art male buddies. Benjamin Jones is my main right. uh, male art friend, and he's, it's been, at first, before he became such a star, he would send me, he would put, really send little drawings, and he would build his postcard around some, one of his wonderful little drawings. Um, yeah, I had a friend in Brooklyn who was really a um, major. He would he, he would send me envelopes that were painted. The envelopes would be actual paintings, and it was a very uh, active interaction um, between us. And do you know the post office? There was a man at the post office who asked um, if he could. Have. He asked Bob to ask me if he could have some of those envelopes, <laughs> if I didn't want them. I did uh, a, a book at Nexus Press titled Hope Plus Go. Equals It had a physics uh, element in, in it, and but lots of color, and it was very, after that I launched myself on my own because I got I help the director of Nexus Press helped me find my letter press. And I got my own press, which was in 1987. Um, I um, did the first book off that press was Measure, Cut, Stitch, because I was in a process of thinking about measuring how we measure in our lives in so many ways, and uh, so. When I it got to the caliphon in the back, and I had to put where it was printed and the name of the press, well, I was asking friends to help me think, what can I name my press? Because I had an etching press too, so I really had a working press going, and um, uh, so nobody came up with anything satisfactory. So I got to thinking, I was 63 years old, the year I got the press, why not call it 63 plus? In the early 90s, I was, it was a very vigorous artist book producing time for me. Um, I did one, two, after that measure cut stitch, I did about change about. But then in the early 90s, I did about five, I did a book a year. That work got, I mean, those books got into collections you know, really important collections in this country and in Canada and a couple of, in uh, Europe, in uh, England. I think of the garden as completing my rhythms. We, are, we all have a sort of set of rhythms going on that we may not know, uh, be aware of. And uh, it, it is, um, it satisfies a side of, of the art is more cerebral. The, and when I work in the studio, I'm using a, a, that part of myself. It, it is emotional too, but the garden is another whole whole set of feelings that it satis that I satisfy by working in it. I have this thing about beauty. I have an extra quotient of need for beauty. I think because. When I sit, I need my eyes need to scan on beauty. You know, came 
slowly became a very important part of my art. The, mm -hmm. the pieces that I've constructed that go in there are an example of that sculpture, you know. Sure it is. And mm -hmm. sculpture, kinds of sculpture are a part of my work. In talking about the different materials you use, I was sitting here and I was remembering going to a performance that you were a part of at the Cannon Chapel mm -hmm. at Emory University. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a performance with Chip Epstein, is that? No. Who was that? that it was, was Bruce Hampton. Bruce Hampton. The main musician, wild, creative, <laughs> mad kind of musician, and who asked a, a few of his friends to come and participate too. And we had done a tape, Dick Robinson and I had done a tape, the uh, musicians were to play off that tape also, sort of do their own thing, but knowing Bruce, he kind of got lost. Uh, they were up in the rafters, they were, his mm -hmm. musicians were all over yeah, in the like, garden. I did um, a thing, that little book sculpture down there was part of it, and uh, the, the audience was on the deck, and I was walking back and forth with, I had a text in my hand and I walked back and forth and I had sound hooked to me that Dick Robinson helped me develop to had on a gossamer kind of a top with a um, sound thing mm -hmm. taped to me and it had some nature of sound other thing and then just a few minor collaborations um, that with Dick Higgins uh, where um, my voice was manipulated electronically And you know, I think of it as a big responsibility. Being an artist is um, a big responsibility because you could just as well be making ugliness as beauty. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we have no pattern. We have to trust our own eye and our own judgment, and we have to know when to plunge in and sort of assume the authority to be an artist.